friends welcome to the ugc cc edusat network and uh, we are today having dr payal nagpal again uh, in this program uh, let me tell you dr payal nagpal is a distinguished scholar and a teacher in the university of delhi and uh, she has worked uh, on theater on drama and uh, she is well versed with developments in uh, indian writing in english uh, today she will be speaking on torudat prose writings and uh, uh, remember that uh, dr payal nagpal is a very lucid this is a very you know uh, direct uh, uh, well uh, uh, rehearsed kind of a person and she makes her points clearly and uh, therefore uh, you can uh, take notes you can uh, respond to her uh, if you feel like and uh, there will be lots of questions uh, emerging in your mind when you listen to her and uh, welcome dr payal nagpal and uh, please begin the lecture thank you thank you dr prakash uh, <coughs> Good morning, viewers. Uh, today's lecture is on Torudat, and I'll be uh, discussing her prose writings. Uh, in the first half, I'll be discussing the letters written by Torudat to her friend uh, Mary Martin uh, in England, and uh, in the second half, I'll be discussing uh, an unfinished novel written by Torudat. Uh, the title of the novel is Bianca <coughs> or the Young Spanish Maiden. um uh, we must keep in mind that torudat is uh, the first indian woman to have written a novel in english and uh, that is why a discussion on uh, uh, bianca is very very important uh, at the same time uh, this uh, novel is an unfinished novel it's a it's a fragment that we have with us so uh, to actually sensitize uh, you know the the the, the viewers to torudat and her context uh, i will begin by uh, telling you people a little bit about her life and her her sensibility that emerges through the letters that she writes uh, uh, to her friend if we look at the years uh, the, in which uh, during which torudat lived she lived she had a very very brief life she was born in 1856 and she uh, died in 1877 so she lives for just 21 years but uh, it is an extremely productive life uh, during her lifetime she wrote a lot but more important than that she read a lot there is, there is uh, uh, i think uh, there are hardly any 19th century english and european writers that she was not familiar with so uh, during her lifetime uh she publishes uh, she published essays on uh, the french uh, poets and on uh, henry vivian de rosio also uh she contributed poetry on a regular basis uh, to the bengal magazine and the calcutta review uh in 1876 um, there is a collection uh, that was published it was uh, it's called a sheaf cleaned in french fields uh it's actually a a, a collection of um, Uh, uh poetry that has been translated from french to english by torudat uh after her death there are two other uh you know books that were published one is of course the unfinished novel bianca or the young spanish maiden which was brought out in 1878 and uh, there is a journal that she had written in french which is the journal of mademoiselle the hours and uh, this was published in 1879 and is available in translation uh, now um uh, if we look at the context of uh, these years uh, 1856 to 77 some very important events kind of frame uh, torudat's life and we can see of course uh, the revolt of 1857 happened and she was just a year old and uh, at the in this is of course at the national level at the international level uh, you know the franco-prussian war uh, you know from 1870 to 71 uh was uh you know something very important because the rudat responds to it and uh, i will also mention the crimean war uh, which is of course from 1853 to 56 but uh you know years before her but her her novel ends with actually a i mean the fragment ends uh, uh with a reference to the crimean war and of course the most important factor remains that uh, india is uh, at that time uh, you know a colony uh, of of uh, the british empire so um If you look at Torudat's immediate family, uh, she was a third child of uh, Govind Chandradat and uh, Shetramoni Dat. Uh, she was born in Rambagan, Calcutta. Uh, 
she had a brother, Apshu, and a uh, sister, Aru. Her sister, Aru, had also translated uh, French poetry into English. Uh, but again, uh, both die very young. Uh, the family converted to Christianity in 1862. And uh, we can see that, uh, you know, uh, Toru was, of course, very small. So from the way, from very young, so from the very beginning, she was exposed to, uh, uh, you know, a, a totally different way of life. So having uh, been a Hindu family that converted to Christianity. Uh, interestingly, in 1870, they traveled to England. And uh, there, uh, uh, Toru, uh, Toru Dutt uh, attended higher lectures for women at Cambridge. That's how it's called. It's higher lectures for women at Cambridge. And while at Cambridge, she meets her friend uh, Mary Martin. And she returns to Calcutta in 1873. And uh, what begins uh, in 1873 is a very long correspondence uh, you know, between Mary Martin and uh, Toru Dutt. So, um, Chandani Lokange in her, uh, you know, in the in the book that she has edited, collected prose works uh, by Torudat. Um, uh, the letters have been uh, kind of, you know, uh, 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 put there, and uh, the letters give a very very vivid picture of uh, Calcutta, of India at the time, and the response of this very young mind that is exposed to a lot of literature that is, uh, you know, not from India, but that is English and European. So, and of course, uh, you know, the, the, the French uh, impact predominates. So, um, these friends, that's uh, Mary and Toru, they are, they are friends and uh, they have two different cultural sensibilities as women. And we do get a little inkling into, uh, you know, what uh, uh, her friend Mary Martin really thought because it's mentioned uh, indirectly in the letters uh, that Toru uh, wrote to her. And this continues, this correspondence continued right to, uh, uh, you know, almost uh, till the time before Toru's death, uh, death uh, you know, when she is taken ill. So, um, before we actually discuss the unfinished novel Bianca, it is important to understand uh, Toru's own, uh, Toru Dutt's own sensibility as uh, understood through these uh, letters. There is to begin with <clears throat> a very clear yearning for England. I mean, as I said that, you know, uh, they had, the family had traveled to England in 1870. So there's a very clear yearning for England and a kind of rejection of uh, what she calls uh, the native space. In fact, she um, throughout she continues to use the word uh, native and is actually um, uh, you know, kind of uh, checked by her friend and she kind of responds to that and I'll discuss that a little later. But uh, she rejects uh, the, the space uh, that she inhabits in <coughs> India, that's Calcutta, and she detests the uh, narrow parochial climbs. So, um, they import uh, not just uh, books in a sense uh, from uh, England, but also uh, saplings, seeds to plant new varieties of uh, English plants, fruits, trees. Uh, at the same time, it's interesting how she notes that, you know, there is no smell to uh, some of these and the Indian varieties have, uh, uh, you know, a fragrance which is very different. But uh, there is this um, effort at creating in India, uh, an, uh, you know, an English space that they can uh, inhabit. So, every, every other letter is actually marked by this desire to go to England and she, you know, continually tells her friend that, you know, I will be... Uh, uh, traveling to England again and uh, uh, there is talk about how they, the family intends to sell their property in India, in Calcutta and actually uh, totally move to England. So, um, and towards the end of, however, towards the end of the correspondence uh, with uh, Mary Martin, there is also a realization that this might not be possible. And uh, the years, uh, we, we must keep in mind, of course, that uh, this, this kind of travel is something that was not very easy, you know, traveling from uh, India to England was not very easy. And of course, we, one only had the sea route. And uh, 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 to my mind, of course, I think about uh, uh, another woman writer some year, some decades later, uh, Krupabai Satinadan, who actually gets a scholarship and all arrangements are made for her to uh, study abroad, but she cannot travel. and. Uh, uh, that is why she actually moves to Madras to complete her uh, education. So, 
years close to uh, Toru's death, uh, in, uh, she also feels that she wants to somewhere she now wants to stay back in India. And uh, this uh, growth, this evolution in a sense uh, is uh, very important. It's also the evolution of a mind that's, you know, kind of now um, uh, 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 more mature and uh, looks at uh, her own immediate context in Calcutta very differently. So there's a strange ambivalence in her reflections on both space and territory. And we can think about uh, the impact that this, of course, uh, might have had on her development as a woman of the 19th century. So uh, uh, I will, uh, you know, just uh, quote from uh, one or two of her letters. Uh, so she, she writes that we all, in one of her very early letters, she writes, we all want much to return to England. We miss the free life we led there. Here, we can hardly go out of the limits of our own garden. But Bogmari, Bogmari is the, the garden uh, uh, area, it's the uh, house they used to stay in uh, during the vacations. So, but Bogmari here happily is a pretty big place and we walk around our own park as much as we like. Uh, again, in a letter uh, written in 1874, she writes, uh, the free air of Europe and the free life there are things not to be had here. So uh, she's able to uh, compare the very, very congested spaces um, to which she belongs in uh, Calcutta. And uh, even though Bogmari, of course, is, it has a huge park and, you know, she's, she can travel around there. And um, uh, she constantly in her let letters, she refers to the garden and how there is space. And she can just sit in the garden and she can read a lot. But um, when I talk, meant to say congested spaces, this is a reference to uh, to Rudat's own perception of uh, Calcutta at large. And uh, she, she writes in 1876, I should like to go to England very much, just to see you, dear. Then I should like to go to south of France in the wine country. Sometime when I'm at rest, I think it would be better to live here in my own country. So from 1873, by the time you know she's writing in 1876, there is a realization that has set in that this travel might not be possible and uh, this um, yearning that they have, the desire to actually settle down in England uh, might be a distant dream. So um, uh, this, this um, understanding of space by this very, very young mind is a very significant pointer. And uh, uh, I think this realization is also something uh, that can be credited to her uh, habit of reading. She reads on a daily basis and all the letters, she's, she's uh, talked continually, she's been continually of books that she has read, books that she has uh, asked for, books that she has been gifted, that she have ordered from abroad. So uh, it's, it's her awareness of the literature of the time is, is just uh, really amazing. So um, at the same time, uh, you know, Calcutta for her is also a space where uh, being uh, converts, Hindu converts to Christianity, uh, they do not enjoy that kind of space or any link with other people. And uh, so it's, it's a rather um, lonely life also, you know, that she, she leads and they are primarily with their immediate family. So as they were Christian converts and were not accepted by the Hindu community, um, she, she talks about her grandmother and she says that, I wish you knew her. She is, I am sad to say, still a Hindu, but she is so gentle and loves us so much. So Christianity or conversion in that sense is an idea that uh, takes the family towards uh, you know, a more a modern sensibility that is setting in in India at the time. And in 1876, in another letter, she mentions this. She says, the day, you know, in contrast, of course, is the space, uh, you know, in Calcutta. But as I said, that her later letters, th we need to compare this with what she writes later and, uh, you know, uh, where she understands the context of Calcutta very differently. So she writes that, you know, the day before yesterday, my mother's cousin was married. Uh, she is a Hindu and so is her family. So, of course, we were not invited. So, um, uh, the, the letters, uh, you know, apart from this, tell, her, tell us about, as I said, that, you know, she continually writes to her friend about what she has read and discusses the texts. And uh, uh, she engaged with a wide range of writers. She had read almost all of Shakespeare's plays. Um, she had uh, read Charles Dickens, George Sand. Uh, she was very, very fond of uh, Victor Hugo. And she had read uh, Hugo's um, uh, poetry, plays, and the novels. Uh, she was familiar with Balzac and read a little bit of Zola. She had heard of Flaubert. Uh, she had read uh, Erkman Shatrian. Um, 
Carlyle's History of the French Revolution, Jules Verne's Minette's History of the French Revolution, plays by uh, Cornell, Moller, uh, Sir Bulwer Lytton's uh, Last of the Barons, George Eliot's Mill on the Floss, Thackeray's Esmond, Newcomb's Vanity Fair, Charles Bronte's Jane Eyre and Charles Bronte's uh, biography, The Life of Charles Bronte by Mrs. Gaskell. So um, this is, it is, it is just um, really, uh, you know, I mean, one is in awe of uh, someone like Torudat who has really uh, read uh, so much. I mean, really one wouldn't do as much in a lifetime maybe. So uh, she, and in, 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 in all these readings, uh, there's, there is a point in her letters where she mentions that she has read four books on uh, the history of the revolution and she focuses on political questions, social questions, uh, geological, literary, theatrical and so on. And while she's reading, she's also translating French poetry into English. And she says that, you know, her father's told her that when her translations reach about 200 pieces, that is when it is going to be published in book form. Until then, of course, she keeps contributing to the Bengal magazine on a regular basis. Um, on her birthday, she's uh, been she's gifted uh, a, a book, uh, this novel uh, by Charles Dickens. Uh, her mother gives her Barnaby Raj, and her father gives her a volume of uh, Barrett Browning's uh, poetry. So, um, uh, with with this, uh, I would uh, also uh, like we have with us uh, the course coordinator, Dr. An Prakash and uh, who's, uh, who specializes in, 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 in Indian English writing. And uh, uh, we would like to, uh, I would like to ask him uh, and request him to actually comment on, uh, uh, you know, a writer like Torudat and, uh, you know, the, the absolutely wide expanse of uh, mm -hmm. writings that she has really covered. Actually, uh, Dr. Payad Nagpal, <coughs> uh, the point that has really struck home is the point regarding her evolution as a woman and as a scholar. These two, two points you have made. And at the age of 20, 21, if she is evolving at the speed, if she is reading so much, if she is responding so much, and most of the things that you mentioned, uh, particularly French Revolution, Balzac, Flaubert, you know, these are the writers and this is the event, uh, French Revolution, that would have inspired in the 19th century a large number of writers. So uh, I was wondering whether uh, you know, uh, she would be uh, at that point of time uh, responding in a particular manner to the French Revolution and to these writers. So, uh, because she is talking about them in letters. So, what kind of impression does emerge of the French Revolution and of the contemporary writing uh, of Balzac and, and others? So, uh, do we have a, a hint of that in the letters? Uh, the, the idea that this is how the French Revolution might have affected life? Or things like this? Uh, actually, uh, as far as the French Revolution per se is concerned, uh, it's, it's not as if, uh, I, I mean, we are relying on Torudat's letters actually for mm -hmm. a lot of these things. Mm -hmm. And uh, there one gets an insight into the fact that she was very keenly interested in the revolution, that much is clear. Mm -hmm. And uh, because her sensibility in that sense is, uh, you know, um, she, she it's, it's part English, part French and of course, mm -hmm. you know, she, she is an Indian. But uh, she says that, you know, she, she wants to focus on political questions, social questions and so on. Now, uh, I think her reading of the French Revolution kind of made her sympathetic towards what was also happening in India. This is significant. Yes. Well, if, if a woman writer, uh, you know, uh, who talks about the French Revolution in the context of freedom, in the context of liberation, in the context of equality, then that adds, you know, value to her writing as a woman. So this, this, is, this is the point that has come across very well. And uh, what about the contemporary writing that, uh, that she would have read at that time? Uh, she's uh, very, very sharp. For instance, uh, she really appreciates almost all of what is written by Victor Hugo, but is slightly uh, critical of uh, uh, the novels, uh, the longish novel that uh, he writes. And throughout her, uh, I mean, towards the latter part uh, of her life, when she's reading Victor Hugo's, uh, you know, The Miserable, The Miserables, and she's, uh, she's very upset about the fact that it's a novel that keeps going on and on. Mm -hmm. Yet at the same time, she's also heard of Zola and she tries to read something there. And uh, history is an area that really interests her. And uh, <coughs> she, uh, she's very, um, and I, as I said, that, that in a sense translates, I think, into her very sharp understanding of India. Mm -hmm. And she makes lots of comments about the governor generals uh, in India, uh, the lieutenant governor uh, of Calcutta, and uh, the fact that, you know, Prince of Wales visits 
uh, Calcutta around the time. Mm -hmm. So, and she responds to these things. You mean she is a significant precursor to what will emerge in Indian writing at that time. She is writing yes. in the 19, uh, 1860s and 70s. So, at that point of time, the, the idea of freedom is being discussed in India, uh, at least at the elites level. Yes. So, that's one. The second thing that, uh, once again, you know, I, I refer to your comments, uh, is regarding women writers of the time. Mm. So, you, you mentioned uh, George Eliot. Yes. It? So, what does she think of uh, writers like uh, George Eliot? Uh, she she enjoyed uh, reading uh, George Eliot and uh, Charlotte Bronte particularly, mm -hmm. and she had heard of uh, Emily Bronte. So she really enjoyed reading the women writers, and she uh, says that. And uh, I think this again reflects in her creation of the character of Bianca. Mm -hmm. I think that's where, if we actually, uh, you know, when we discuss uh, the, the the fragment of a novel that's available to us, uh, uh, one can see the impact of uh, particularly George Eliot. And, and is she uh, self-conscious about uh, writing? Was uh, some writers are conscious you know, that, that they'll be read even, even 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 with respect to the letters? So at the age of twenty-one, she would not think that these letters would be read. And if that is the case, then she is writing her heart out in a way to, yes. to, to, to another friend, you know, who is a woman. And therefore, these writers have that kind of these uh, letters have that kind of authenticity, yes. which might be missing in the ri writings of others. Others, yes. That is true. It's it, it's something that is very very authentic. For instance, she talks about the death of a sister. She talks about uh, uh, you know the the uh, horses that they buy and lots of other things that happen in the house. She does mention all these details. But uh, what is remarkable is that every single letter where she's detailing whatever happens in the house and so on mm -hmm. is accompanied by a discussion of uh, whatever she has read, and she shares that with her friend and asks her friend uh, to also respond to uh, what she has read. Mm -hmm. So in a sense sharing notes on that front. And she also shares with her friend some of her translations. I That's see. also a part of her letters. Mm -hmm. So actually the letters really speaking are literary pieces that we have uh, with us, uh, something really to be treasured. And uh, uh, a very, very vivid picture of, uh, of Calcutta, of uh, India, of uh, uh, the, as I said, the sensibility of somebody mm -hmm. who's mm -hmm. from being an Indian is has has adopted a more modern sensibility and is responding to these issues. You are giving a lot so of uh, valuable information for for the uh, young scholars here. So uh, welcome. Yes. And and it's, it's important because a lot of, uh, <laughs> for instance, uh, you know, uh, the, in the letters, uh, uh, these are interspersed with references to Indian flora and fauna. Much as of course they are trying to create an English space. So you have a reference to birds uh, such as the kokila and this one that she calls the bhimraj and so on. So, uh, uh, I'd also specifically like to focus a little bit on, uh, you know, her uh, crea uh, her response uh, to Calcutta as a place, and it, it it kind of comes alive. There's a mention <coughs> of the Hooghly Bridge and the fact that you know people are writing about it and uh, people are dancing and um, you know they are all very happy about uh, this uh, uh, bridge. And however, she of course at the same time says that you know uh, someone like her who has already seen this was. Uh, canal, uh, you know, uh, really, uh, what can the Hooghly mean? But um, uh, then again, she mentions the famine uh, uh, references, many references to Durga Puja uh, celebrations, um, how she takes a tour of Calcutta and praises the Eden Gardens and, uh, of course, comes at what she calls the native streets. And she says, the streets, and I quote, the streets in the native quarter of Calcutta are so dirty, narrow and blocked up, that it is a wonder to me how we get through them without some accident. Uh, quote unquote. And I think here, more than the uh, space, I think the fact that, uh, uh, you know, there is this felt need that she recognizes uh, of change in India, and which is also happening around that time. And of course, we have the social reform movements and so on. But it, she recognizes that, which is why I think that translates into her anxiety and her response uh, towards uh, the, the uh, narrow streets of Calcutta. I think it's more to do with the narrow-mindedness of people there. So, uh, and she says that you know the European part of the town is far better, though far inferior. She says to some fashionable parts of London. Um, and I think uh, you know this this uh, trans transposition of uh, thought to space is something she mentions in another letter written in 1876, where she says that sometimes I wish I were out of Calcutta, as Calcutta is such a horrid place socially and morally backbiting, and scandal are in full swing. So she visualizes a more modern space, 
uh, where people are more free. She constantly talks about the free air of Europe and she wants that there. And uh, by the time she's, uh, see, she lives uh, only till 1877, but right up uh, towards the end, there is a very distinct change. And I'd like to uh, just uh, uh, read this uh, quote out very carefully. She, uh, in 1876, it's a letter written in June 1876, uh, she writes, as for the state of demoralization of English society, I shall neither be surprised at nor afraid of it. Calcutta is a very sink of iniquity not only among the Hindus, but even among the Bengali Christians, the moral is so execrable. And the sad saddest thing is that Hindus have a very bad idea of Christianity. But let me stop here. The manners of Bengali Christian society are such as would sadden the merriest heart and dishearten the most hopeful. So um, I think as a very, very uh, young uh, uh, writer, reader, she understands this need for things to change in Calcutta, which is of course, uh, you know, emblematic of this need for things to change in India at a larger level. And um, uh, she's critical of uh, both uh, uh, the, the society of converts and she's critical of, uh, you know, the, her, uh, the Hindu community that is there. And she feels that, you know, it's more of a scandal and a, a gossip circle that exists and true change or true sensibility of the mind is something that needs to be brought in. And for, for Torudat, if you go by the letters that she has written to her friend, I think she sees, sees that in reading, in engaging with literature of that time. And I think that is a very, very valuable pointer that she, she leaves for us even in the 21st century, how we need to engage with the literature of, uh, of a particular period and of our own time. So uh, she recognizes, for instance, that you know she has hopes for Calcutta when she says the coming up of skating rinks and she talks about a new zoological garden where all sorts of animals of different species are being brought. And she says, well, Calcutta will soon be a European city. So um, I think Torudat's letters uh, point towards this need uh, for a more educated and a more reformed uh, society. Uh, uh, with this, we will uh, move into uh, the second phase of uh, this lecture, a discussion on Bianca or the Young Spanish Maiden. Good morning viewers, we were discussing Torudat's uh, uh, letters that she had written to her friend uh, Mary Martin and um, some of the important points uh, of the letters uh, have been this uh, need, as I said, for a more uh, uh, educated and a more reformed space. Um, in this very uh, brief life, Torudat has a lot to say about social practices and customs. She is very young but uh, a very honest and genuine response that she gives. And uh, she says that, you know, um, uh, the Beng uh, we do not go much into society now. And uh, apart from the fact that, of course, as converts, they are not really invited for a lot of the uh, gatherings. She says that the Bengali reunions are generally for men. Wives and daughters and all womankind are confined to the house, lock and key. 
and she also recognizes at the same time again this is a letter that's written uh, much later it's 1870 dated 1876 where she says that and europeans are generally supercilious and look down upon bengalis so i think um, a more mature perspective has kind of set in where she recognizes the problem of her immediate society and at the same time she's able to recognize the way in which uh, indians are being uh, treated at the hands of the colonizers so um, she she responds to the issue of marriage because wherever she goes she is asked you know whether she is married or how many children she has actually and she of course turns around and tells people that she is not married so she, she uh, in her letter uh, she writes um, marriage you know is a great thing with the hindus an unmarried girl of 15 is never heard of in our country for it is considered scandalous if a girl is not wooed and married before she is 8 years old and here i think a lot of credit goes to the family also for uh, giving a certain kind of upbringing uh, to uh, to these uh, uh, girls because both aru and uh, toru that uh, they they write so um, again towards uh, uh, you know absolutely uh, the last year of her life in 1877 she she recognizes that hindus are getting more liberal in their views Uh, you see hindus have to mix with the europeans here european judges european officials and they come into contact with them daily so um, she she is she in her letters she marks this change and at the same time uh, much earlier she recognizes how uh, there is a kind of discrimination that is practiced and she she mentions how uh, you know there is no indian who actually manages to clear uh, the civil service examination and how they are not allowed to enter the military as officers she is very critical of these things and in her letters she mentions two very important incidents one is the case of uh, Bab- uh, babu uh, jugonando uh, mukherjee and this is in 1876 how he he allowed you know during the visit of the prince of wales um he allow uh, 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 mukherjee allowed uh, the prince of wales uh, to see the uh, zenana now that was something that was not allowed and there's this very interesting article that appears on this issue and uh, uh, to that refers to that and says it's a very sensible response that you know uh, if uh, the women were allowed to uh, come out openly then it was fine but only an exception for the prince of wales was not appropriate um, so uh, again uh, you know she refers to uh, the anglo european ladies uh, you know whipping their servants and she says we have no real english gentlemen or ladies in india except a very few people generally come out to india to make their fortunes so uh, you know the the fact that there is so much in the country uh, that is uh, uh, you know taken away by the colonizer uh, she also um, you know refers to governor generals uh, you know successive governor generals in her letters so from lord northbrook to uh, who's who was much loved by the bengalis lord lytton who had poetic inclinations and lord strachey so um and uh, uh she also refers to an incident where lord lord lytton when he defends uh you know uh, uh, an indian in a particular case uh, with the european uh, uh, he severely criticizes the european official and in turn lord lytton is uh, you know he's criticized for his interference but through this incident she also looks at uh, how the legal system really doesn't uh, value the life uh, of an indian so um, there is also a reference in her letters in 1876 to the fact that there will be a great darbar at delhi during the cold season when the viceroy will declare victoria no more queen but empress of india so uh, i think her uh, the fact that she reads a lot of the histories and uh, uh, she reads about the revolution sensitizes her towards what's happening in her own country and this is we are talking about somebody who's you know when she writes these letters she's just about 18 19 years old and uh, uh, this kind of uh, maturity of thought is very very important in fact in one of the letters one understands that her friend kind of you know slightly uh, uh, checks her and reprimands her so she writes she says and uh, uh, this is her response is very important she says thank you very much uh, for what you say about calling my countrymen natives the reproof is just and i stand corrected i shall take care and not call them natives again it is indeed a term used by prejudiced anglo indians and i'm really ashamed to have used it so uh, you know it's a, it's a very very straight from the heart honest kind of response having said this having discussed torudat's letters i would like to now kind of you know use this this uh, socio cultural context uh, to which torudat belongs her sensibility to look at 
uh, the unfinished novel that we have. It's titled Bianca or the Young Spanish Maiden. Um, the, it's, it's the, the title is based on the uh, name of the protagonist who's Bianca and she's a Spanish girl. Interestingly, the novel is set in uh, the English countryside and uh, the protagonist is half Spanish, part Spanish and part English. So this, the, the Spanish element to her is, is supposed to be uh, the wild, the uncontrolled uh, aspect of uh, Bianca. Uh, interestingly, this book is not really speaking mentioned in her letters where uh, for the most uh, she discusses as she cleaned in French fields. But uh, the, uh, uh, the, the one wonders why you know, there is no mention about this particular novel. But here I'd like to mention something that's there in the letters, which is that when the census uh, uh, happens in Calcutta and uh, her father is approached, she, want, she tells her father that she wants to write authoress against her name, but he declines and it doesn't happen. So, uh, you know, I, I think the 19, in the 19th century, women were particularly uh, generally wary of, uh, we, we know, the use of the male pseudonym by English women writers, but here is a writer in India who wanted the name, uh, that, uh, the, the uh, vocation of authoress against her name. And uh, of course, it was not uh, uh, done according to her wishes. So, uh, now these ideas, her relationship with her father, her sensibility where she reads a lot, all these are kind of replicated in the novel Bianca. Um, you know, there is, uh, the, the model is uh, certainly not of the 18th century novel that, that is used here. It is the model of the 19th century novel that is used in uh, Bianca, where it's, you know, the, the, the romantic sensibility and at the same time, a realist style of writing where we, where we have, uh, you know, um, an understanding of uh, the, the, the context to which uh, you know, uh, a particular uh, social group belongs and how women are emerging in that uh, context. So, um, her writing shows, uh, you know, an acknowledgement of both the romantic and the realist style. So, the relationship between the father and daughter is really speaking at the center of it all and uh, uh, it is like Toru's own relationship with her father and uh, uh, here too in the novel, in the novel Bianca, the father too publishes to kind of eke out a living. and. Uh, it's pure conjecture, we don't know when the novel was written, but it seems that the novel could have been written towards the end of Toru's life. It has a very, very pessimistic beginning. There's a lot of sadness and a very sharp pessimism that is there. And it begins with the funeral procession of uh, uh, Inez, uh, who is uh, Bianca's sister. So, and of course, one thinks of Aru's death here, but uh, it is Inez's death, uh, Inez's death that is discussed in detail in chapter one. Um, interestingly, this novel, the fragment that we have, is of uh, eight chapters. So, uh, in this very uh, chapter, the first chapter, which is to do with death and a funeral procession, the 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 way the the, the weather has been described, it only adds to uh, um, uh, an atmosphere of gloom. But through this atmosphere of gloom, there is a spark, and that spark is Bianca, and she is. Uh, she manages to, much as there are moments when she feels that she could have also died with Inez, but she manages to survive and she emerges, uh, you know, and comes out of uh, uh, this uh, situation uh, successfully. So the Christian idea of suffering, of sacrifice are evoked and of course that provides the toll uh, English colouring. One can also see the impact, I think, of, uh, I would say, Dickens here, maybe, because uh, she is very uh, conscious and at the level of craft, at the level of language, she is using, she's blending uh, proper English with the use of the dialect. And it's, uh, uh, for instance, the housekeeper Martha has a specific dialect. There is a kind of gibberish that is used by uh, the child Will, uh, and uh, uh, there is another uh, so, uh, the valet John, whose dialect is slightly different from Martha. And of course, uh, you have the upper class that is using uh, proper language, so to say. And uh, there is um, uh, uh, a marked feature in terms of the syntax is that, you know, the sentences are continuous. It seems as if, you know, this was, this could have been a draft. Uh, one doesn't know these, this is all uh, pure conjecture, but it could have been a draft because, you know, the, where uh, uh, the, the, words spoken by, let's say, Bianca N and suddenly uh, the words uh, spoken by, uh, let's say, uh, Mr. Garcia uh, begin. It, so it's, it, it becomes slightly difficult to make that out at times. So, but uh, this, 
this understanding of different uh, languages and dialects and how they are related to specific social groups she she shows that uh, awareness very well and uses this uh, uh, you know to uh, puts this to good use in the novel so uh, if you just look at the plot just a very 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 brief overview of the plot if we can call it one bianca is shown as uh, very close to her father mr gashia who's of course very fond of uh, you know his children and he has he has lost all other children uh, and it's only bianca who's now alive and uh, he was particularly fond of anes and so as i said the novel begins on this note of death but it marks the beginning of a new bond between the father and daughter because uh, it's it's bianca's generally been the one uh, who's you know who's been in control and anes was the one who had to be taken care of and together they mourn the loss of uh, anes so um, elaborate descriptions as I said of nature kind of you know partake of this uh, dismal mood as the father falls ill it is uh, bianca who takes charge and helps him recover and she's shown to be somebody very strong who can manage her own affairs and she says that she says uh, i am strong i can take care of myself um however the father is of course very worried about uh, bianca and asks her what would you do if i were to leave you and die and she says with great conviction you are not going to die father i won't let you so the mood remains philosophical as both father and daughter ponder over the transience of life and uh, kind of you know rediscover their relationship and in, in all of this is also a, another character in characterization also you know begins she picks it up gradually so you have uh, this there's this character called Walter Ingram who's introduced he was uh, uh, Inez's suitor and uh, she was to be married to him and uh, he's shown to be the sweet person who then decides that he's under some obligation to the family and maybe he should marry uh, 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 Bianca and Bianca's response to this is very 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 interesting because she turns around and she says that no i can be like a sister to you so she she uh, uh, kind of you know helps uh, walter ingram understand what he really uh, wants in life and she suggests that he get probably get married uh, to uh, maggie uh, now maggie is the daughter of uh, lady moore and we know that uh, the, the 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 title itself tells us that this is the upper class that she's referring to so uh, we can see the uh, impact of writers like jane austen george eliot charles dickens i think it's it's very clearly there right <coughs> in this context another very important uh, 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 development is the very construction of bianca as the protagonist of the novel so bianca is shown to be uh, you know she she blends the feminine with the potential uh, you know for the wild so to say and um, you know she they, 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 it, it's shown that she is very attached to lord uh, moore's uh, younger brother will and uh, she is happy with her as long as lord uh, 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 you know she is very happy with the child and so on but she is quick to uh, you know reject the model of the feminine and she says when she is asked by lord moore about uh, her love for children she says uh, not of all indeed not of any except will children do not seem to like me very much i have lived so lonely with only my father for a companion that i do not know how to make children love me so it's not a model that she is yearning for it's not that model of femininity so to say that she is really striving for and she is shown to be a very very confident woman so much so that uh, lady moore in the absence of uh, you know lord moore is very comfortable with her but uh, in in the presence of her son she she does not want any alliance between the two and detests bianca and she calls her a spanish gypsy and believes that her son is meant for better taste and uh, when her friend uh, maggie uh, you know uh, says that you know white suits her uh, mrs moore is quick to check her and says there you are wrong margaret white suits fair complexions and miss garcia is a dark beauty dark is a gypsy i declare um, so uh, why does torudat make the protagonist of this novel a dark woman and uh, to my mind you know maggie tulliver immediately uh, you know comes and one can see a direct connection uh, here but uh, more than that i think uh, within our, within the context of 19th century india she is making a point here by making uh, the protagonist as a woman who's a dark woman she's using the space of the novel to bring forth Uh, a character that would be otherwise you know a quite a marginalized character 
and uh, here is this woman who's dark and uh, like a gypsy so um, and is somebody who's, who's rejecting those models of femininity uh, and uh, you know uh, Lord Moore himself says he says she's a little wild so much the better she is as nature made her her father has let her have her own ways in almost everything I wonder if he'll part with her and Lord Moore sees this pride in Bianca as not as something uh, acquired it's innate and natural and uh, she's uh, you know like she when she takes care of her father she's perfectly in control she writes to the doctor calls the doctor she takes charge of the situation and manages it well and when she actually visits uh, the Moore household uh, on her way back when she's asked by Lord Moore that you know she should be uh, if he could drop her home she tells him that she carries a pistol and that's something that her father had got her so this kind of uh, strength and uh, the conviction that she can take care of herself is a very very significant factor uh, that uh, you know Toru Torudat uh, builds here and uh, here again I'd like to bring in uh, Dr. Anand Prakash and ask him his views on you know a, ca a character like Bianca I mean she's there's so much that Torudat has given us in just these brief eight chapters and uh, uh, you know created a very very it's a very uh, sharply and clearly delineated character that's quite true and uh, <coughs> uh, Dr. Nagpal the way uh, you have described the plot of the novel plot of the novel seems to be that there's a young woman and she'll mature later on and that she might have to marry and that given this kind of a family whether she would be happy in that marriage or not mm -hmm. uh, that that is clearly in the picture uh, but it's because it's an incomplete novel it's yes. actually only a fragment so therefore you have the uh, topology uh, only in the initial sense later on how it will develop is, is, is a thing you know of conjecture yeah. as you rightly say uh, you are right in saying and I uh, definitely agree with you that it's a strong woman character in the making and that the strength of the author has gone into the strength of this person uh, uh, there are one or two questions regarding you know just the uh, superficial aspects of, of the fiction you know this, this fiction uh, talks about the French uh, of the Spanish family yes. and then you say that the background seems to be English yes. so it means that she is in a way superimposing uh, English onto the plot which belongs to the situation in Spain mm -hmm. that's one and uh, secondly that uh, the woman is from India and, 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 and she, she, is a, she is an Indian you know who has converted to Christianity so she is half English half European or half, half, half Indian so see the kind of complexity what would, what would do you think uh, would have made her write a novel about the Spanish situation uh, and uh, you know keeping away from both uh, English uh, in fact English and French together and Indian and she goes to another territory uh, was there some uh, would there be some you know a compulsion in her mind that she could talk frankly only when she took up the situation of Spain uh, in the in the fragment that we have the references to the Spanish family and uh, again it's part Spanish she is part uh, Bianca's part Spanish and part English because the mother's English and the father's mm -hmm. Spanish mm -hmm. so uh, but I think the Spanish aspect is used to highlight a person who is non-English in that sense and is uh, uh, you know uh, uh, wild in that sense because uh, you know uh, at just at the thought that uh, you know Lord Moore might marry uh, Bianca. Which means uh, Spain would be a kind of equivalent to India. Yes, and Back in home. fact, I was just d uh, coming to that. In, uh, in fact, uh, just at the thought that uh, you know, uh, Lord Moore might marry mm -hmm. uh, Bianca, uh, she says, Lady Moore says, marry a Spanish gyp gypsy and adventurer's daughter. She might have been a zingara for what we know. So she uses the term zingara here, and uh, I think it's basically a substitution for for an Indian woman mm -hmm. because. Uh, I think there was this realization in Torudat, and this mm. is again conjecture, but uh, pro probably there was this realization in uh, Torudat as a writer that uh, a novel uh, with an Indian woman there, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, you know, uh, coming up with this kind of a very sharp sensibility might not be accepted because uh, she also knew that a sheep clean in French fields was very well accepted and she got a lot of adulation became almost a kind of public figure so much so that people started saying that it was prob uh, Toru Dutt is a fictitious person and uh, this was probably written by a European so mm -hmm. I think she uh, did not uh, maybe want to have an Indian figure there so I think uh, it's probably a kind of I mean, uh, that's all the problem uh, Dr. Nagpal and secondly 
Uh, do you think this novel would have been uh, a tragic novel? Because you say there is a lot of gloom predominant in the uh, existing part and uh, that uh, the marriage or whatever w w would not succeed in, in the long run. What do you say? It certainly has the makings of one. It certainly has the makings of one. Mm -hmm. So in fact, uh, you know, when we uh, move uh, further into the uh, novel, one realizes that uh, for instance, in uh, you know Lord Moore, when he proposes to uh, uh, Bianca, and before that he he kisses her, and that kisses uh, you know her realization of her own body, her realization it's a it's a sexual uh, realization, so to say, and that is something uh, that is uh, she's she's kind of initially um, you know caught unaware unawares, and she goes to her father, she tells him all about it. So there's also a relationship of trust with the father that she has that she can go ahead and tell him everything and uh, the father at the same time uh, you know prior to this incident has been very watchful of her in the presence of Lord Moore because uh, he understands that Lord Moore is uh, very attracted towards uh, Bianca and uh, you know uh, as uh, the younger brother will lets her hair loose she is rebuked by the father in the presence of Lord Moore who of course pacifies the situation after which uh, you know um, uh, uh, you know, the, when she tells the father that Lord Moore had uh, kissed her, he says, I thought you had more spirit in you than to suffer a man to insult you. So uh, he's, he's bringing up, you know, this, there's this kind of uh, a mystery that is there in the relationship between the father and daughter, but the father's also brought up the daughter differently and uh, he's not very happy at the thought that, you know, she will be married off to the Moore family. Also realizing and knowing that, uh, uh, you know, Lady Moore is not going to be in favor of this match. So th this is a marriage between two different social groups. It's not a marriage within the same group and the father realizes this and he says that, you know, what will Lord Moore's mother think of me if I marry my daughter to her son? But I think more than uh, the, 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 the sense that, you know, this is a different social group, I think here he's also worried about his daughter that she's certainly not going to be happy in this kind of a situation. Again, Bianca too recites poetry. In fact, this entire novel is... Uh, kind of, you know, the, the intertextual element is very, very pronounced because there are references to uh, Tennyson's poetry. Uh, you know, a lot of Tennyson's uh, poetry has been uh, used in the novel and uh, poetry by other poets also. So, um, the father is actually, instead of, uh, you know, uh, one would expect that, okay, fine, there is a kind of uh, upward social mobility that Bianca is going to face and maybe, uh, you know, the father will be very happy about it. But the father is hugely disappointed when uh, Lord Moore formally proposes to uh, uh, Bianca. Uh, and he says, well, uh, and when he gets to know that Bianca is interested in marrying Lord Moore, he says, they have all left me, but they all went to God, but you leave me for a man. So, um, He's, he's at the same time not sure of his daughter's feelings and says that, you know, she used to make light of marriage and love before because uh, he, the precedent is a Walter Ingram and she had turned down the proposal. It's not as if she wants to jump on to marriage. So um, here, uh, you know, there are lots of these complexities that are built into the father-daughter relationship. But at the same time, one thing is clear that the father is certain that uh, Bianca cannot be happy in the Moore household. and. Um, what follows after this is that Bianca gets into a delirium and both the father, Mr. Garcia, and uh, Lord Moore tend to her. And it is this that kind of endears uh, Lord Moore, Moore to uh, Mr. Garcia. And he finally accepts uh, him as a suitor for uh, Bianca. And Bianca, of course, uh, is uh, very happy about it. Where this is true, there is also this uh, one particular instance which is uh, worth, uh, you know, discussion because um, when, uh, you know, when she recovers, when Bianca recovers and there is very little chance of her recovery, but she does recover, uh, Lord Moore once again kind of uh, speaks to her and when the father gives his consent, uh, she continues to call, uh, you know, Lord Moore as Lord Moore and she says that, but you are my Lord now more than ever. And uh, one, uh, you know, uh, understands here that maybe um, uh, Torudat is again trying to kind of, you know, also keep a certain uh, social code in mind when she makes her very, very strong heroine kind of uh, say these words, but you are my lord more than ever. Uh, yet at the same time, this does not prevent uh, Bianca from speaking her mind. And uh, uh, 
a new character is introduced in the novel at this stage and this character is uh, Mr. Owen, Mr. and Mrs. Owen and there is a reference you know when she tells her father about Lord Moore having uh, uh, you know uh, approached her she refers to her cousin Maria now we don't know who this cousin is uh, but there is uh, a discuss a little bit about a little snippet about uh, Mrs. Owen and the <coughs> fact that Mrs. Owen is um, uh, is somebody who probably should not have married Mr. Owen and uh, she says he's a really bad man and she says my and he is uh, Lord Moore's cousin so she says my lord take care of that man he's a bold bad man and he must not come here often so within a very conventional situation for Bianca for a woman to actually express her mind about uh, you know her, uh, the, you know the husband's uh, 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 concerns. I mean, he, he's, he's, the marriage has not happened, but uh, Lord Moore has made arrangements that she is not to stay with his mother, and her, her father can stay with them at another estate. Totally. So um, the novel ends again on a very, very, the fragment I should say ends on a very pessimistic note which is that uh, they separate and this is the separation is due to the Crimean War which is why I said that you know this is the, these are some uh, historical events that she kind of brings into the novel and uh, uh, you know Lord Moore is supposed to go and uh, be there uh, at the war front and uh, he, he slips a ring onto her finger and uh, that kind of uh, seals the bond and uh, you know he, he just leaves it unanswered he says that you know even if I were to not come back so the novel uh, the fragment that we have just ends on this note and um, uh, there is a very strong possibility that uh, this could have this could head towards being a tragedy and uh, the, the impact of especially the Owen family is something that uh, 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 you know, I think Torudat had in mind as a writer. So, uh, with this, uh, we come to the end of the lecture, and I think uh, one needs to uh, appreciate the fact that uh, in this uh, very, in a span of about 35 pages or so and eight chapters, Torudat has given us a very, very strong woman character, and uh, this being the first uh, novel written in English by an Indian writer, by an Indian woman. Uh, writer, I think it's important to keep in mind that Bianca, in a sense, sets the trend for uh, you know uh, many such uh, characters, which were only going to be drawn uh, you know uh, with such clarity in the 21st century. I hope you enjoyed this lecture. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Pal Nagpal, and uh, viewers. Uh, we have had a, an excellent lecture uh, on Torudat and her prose writings. And uh, you would have, uh, you know, seen that uh, whatever is written, even if it's a, a series of letters or a, or a small novel, a, an unfinished novel, after 100 years, 150 years, 200 years, this becomes a kind of a history. History, not in the sense in which political developments are discussed, but history in the sense, you know, that this is how people in the 19th century felt. They expressed themselves, and that, that they were women. Then they made the reader aware of the compulsion under which they worked. So uh, 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 this significant lecture, I think, adds to the value of the uh, most lecture program that we have. So thanks, Dr. Pal Nagpal, and uh, viewers, uh, you are welcome to, you. To, to to give uh, you know responses to this uh, through the proper channels. Thanks again. Thank you, Dr.